You're listening to another podcast. A podcast not only of reviewing and discussing, but of discovery. A deep dive into a classic show whose influence is immeasurable. Your next stop, Anthology. Hello and welcome to Anthology, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. I'm your host, Matt Hurt, and if this is your first time listening, Anthology is a podcast where I review The Twilight Zone as a first-time viewer and other classic and contemporary science fiction anthology series. For archives of all of my episodes, including bonus episode reviews like the one that I'm currently in the process of doing for Amazon Prime solos, visit AnthologyPod.com. You can also like the Facebook page at Facebook.com slash AnthologyPod and follow me on Twitter at OVAnthologyPod. And if you'd like to support what I do here, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer, which I have a very silly um, ad read that I'm going to do for the Patreon. Uh, So here we go. Are you in the market for more content from the Obsessive Viewer and our related podcasts, Anthology, and Tower Junkies? You're in luck. Due to a government stimulus check and an overbearing fear of the outside world thanks to a global pandemic, Obsessive Viewer Podcasts is overstocked with Patreon content. Come on down to patreon.com slash obsessive viewer and take advantage of our deals on hundreds of extra content. We've got over 130 B-roll episodes at only $1 per month, TV reviews at $2 per month, full-length movie commentary tracks at $5 per month, and early access to to full episodes plus unreleased and exclusive content at ten dollars per month at these prices we're practically giving this stuff away just head on down to patreon.com slash obsessive viewer to sign up again that website is patreon.com slash obsessive viewer sign up today and tell them pizza sent you um okay so that's the ad for um, patreon um <clears throat> i never don't i never don't feel silly doing that but it's a lot of fun but anyway um patreon.com slash obsessive viewer all the stuff that I mentioned, um, it's a it's a tiered system. So if you get like the two dollar level, you get the TV reviews plus the B roll episodes, and if you get the five dollar tier, you get the the commentary tracks plus the TV plus the uh, B roll stuff. So it it's kind of trickles down from there. Each the higher you go on the tiers, and I am currently on the cusp of doing a um, uh, for the TV tier, which I'm I'm really proud of that one. I think that that's a good a good balance to strike. If you want to pledge $2 per month, you get access to the TV reviews plus the B-roll episodes. In the TV reviews, I am, this Wednesday, I'm going to be starting a weekly uh, recap episode thing for Loki, and I'm currently in the process of doing the same thing for Lisey's story as well. So those episodes on... um, on the $2 level, you get two episodes of me talking about TV per week for the next six weeks or so, um, guaranteed. Plus, I have Falcon and the Winter Soldier reviews and a bunch of other stuff up there. So anyway, check out patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. And uh, if you do, thank you. If not, uh, that's fine. <laughs> so uh, today on the show, I'm going to be discussing Still Valley. It's the 11th episode of the Twilight Zone's third season, and it originally aired on November 24th, 1961. And I'll be rounding out the episode with a brief review of science fiction theater season one episode 19 barrier of silence and i don't have any other um uh pre preamble stuff or anything except to just say that i hope you guys are enjoying the solos bonus review series i'm doing um i got a very kind uh facebook comment from a friend of the show victor gamboa um who said I I did not have it pulled up here. But anyway, he said some very kind things about um about my reviews for solos. He is one of the $10 patrons on Patreon, so he has access to all 7 of those episodes right now. Um and he listened to all of them, had some very kind words to say about it and uh chatted about the show. So I very much appreciate that um and check out his show, The Outer Limits Podcast. It is phenomenal, and I was honored to be a guest on it a few weeks ago, or a month ago. I don't know. Time is time is relative. <laughs> um, so uh, I can't find the find the words. But anyway, um, so yeah, so I was very very pleased with that, and uh, and and very very happy to hear that. So okay, preamble out of the way. Let me go into. Uh, the plot summary for Still Valley. So, of course, at this point, I'm going to be spoiling the entirety of the episode of Still Valley from The Twilight Zone. So if you haven't watched it, um, I'm going to spoil the plot here. So fair warning. And I'm going to read the plot summary courtesy of The Twilight Zone Unlocking the Door to a Television Classic by Martin Grahams Jr. And this is a cold read of it. I am um, <laughs> I have not read the plot summary, so uh, bear with me as I stumble through this uh, reading of it. <clears throat> 
A scout for the Confederates, Joseph Paradine, wanders into a small town at the bottom of Ch- uh, Chenow Valley, uh, only to find every Union soldier frozen in his tracks in the middle of the streets. He rules out all the possibilities, a virus, a plague, and time certainly isn't standing still. Seeking a rational explanation, he finds an old man, a former resident of the town who claims he was solely responsible for the deed. As the seventh son of a seventh son, he made a practice of witchcraft like his father before him and uses words from his special book to freeze the Yanks in their tracks. He proposes freezing the entire Union army in its tracks and end the war, but he won't. He can smell death around the corner and knows he won't be alive come sunrise. Passing the book of witchcraft to Paradine, he gives the scout an opportunity to serve his cause. Paradine takes the book back to camp and makes his reports to the lieutenant. Paradine convinces his commander of the whole uh, that that while there is something not clean about the whole affair, being in league with the devil. He can conjure up a spell and guarantee the success of the Confederate army. After an exchange of words, Paradine throws the book into the fire, sending their chances up in flames, believing that if the book is used, they will be damned, a risk he dares not accept. This episode stars Gary Merrill as Sergeant Joseph Paradine, and this was his only episode of The Twilight Zone, and he doesn't really have much other other science fiction credits to his name, but he did appear in one episode of The, the Outer Limits, The Human Factor, in 1963. Uh, co-starring as Teague, the kind of witchcraft man, is uh, Vaughn Taylor. This is his second of five Twilight Zone episodes. The first we saw from him was in season one as Henry Bemis' boss, Mr. Carsville, in Time Enough at Last. And next we'll see from him is a reteaming with director James Sheldon for later this season, the episode I Sing the Body Electric. And other notable credits for uh, for for Von Taylor are one episode of the of Tales of Tomorrow, two episodes of The Outer Limits, and he his ba- biggest kind of role was as Marion Crane's boss in the movie Psycho. And then rounding out the cast as Dauger or Doger is Ben Cooper. This was his only Twilight Zone episode, and his only other science fiction credit I could find really was uh, one episode of One Step Beyond in 1959. And writer for this episode was Rod Serling, who adapted the story from a short story uh, called The Valley Was Still by Manly Wade Wellman. Uh, that story was first published in 1939, August 1939, in an issue of Weird Tales. And director for this episode was James Sheldon. This is his fifth of six Twilight Zone episodes. Uh, we previously saw his work in It's a Good Life, and next we'll see from him is the aforementioned I Sing the Body Electric later this season. So, <clears throat> now what I'm going to do, as I usually do, is I, I talk about what I knew before going into this episode. Um, but since I actually was a guest on Brandon Cruz's excellent Submitted for Your Approval podcast, Uh, Back in 2019, he brought me on to talk about this episode. So, I have actually seen this episode before preparing this episode of the podcast. Um, If you want to hear my thoughts back in 2019, definitely check out Brandon's podcast. I have a link to that episode in the show notes. And uh, yeah, I just highly recommend checking out all of Brandon's podcast stuff because he's he's really cool and really great. So instead of sharing my thoughts, I'll just plug that episode and uh, and Brandon's podcast. But I will say that it's been a few years since I've watched this episode. So going into this viewing of it, I don't really remember much about it. And yeah, I, I didn't really remember much about it except for a few key details that are still kind of sticking out uh, in a negative way, as you'll see in my review. So with that out of the way, let's go into my review of Still Valley. Um, this episode opens with um, Serling's opening narration right from the jump. And it's one of those episodes that kind of has two chunks of opening narration. So it opens with voiceover narration, and then he pops on the screen after a few lines of dialogue um, to deliver his in-person uh, narration. So just because I'm crazy, or not because I'm crazy, but <laughs> I'm crazy for many different reasons. But for the sake of the structure of this podcast, I'm going to play the entirety of the opening narration here, both parts. So here is the opening narration to Still Valley from Rod Serling. The time is 1863 place the state of Virginia. The event is a mass bloodletting known as the Civil War, a tragic moment in time when a nation was split into two fragments, each fragment deeming itself a nation. This is Joseph Paradine, Confederate cavalry. 
as he heads down toward a small town in the middle of a valley. But very shortly, Joseph Paradine will make contact with the enemy. He will also make contact with an outpost not found on a military map, an outpost called the Twilight Zone. So right from the jump, as I'm watching the show in in chronological order, of course, in order of air dates, I am kind of surprised that, or I found it kind of interesting that season three so far has had two episodes set during the Civil War, and both of those episodes are from the perspective of the Confederate side. So this episode uh, takes place in 1863 in Virginia, as Rod Serling said, during the Civil War from the perspective of a couple of, uh, or really one Confederate sergeant. Um, and it's just, it's kind of unique and I kind of, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like I, I'm, I i do not really care for civil war stories in the twilight zone. And that also extends to Western episodes. Um, for the most part, I feel like, and I feel like I talked about this when I reviewed the grave, but I kind of feel like these period episodes, um, they don't really click with me all that well. Um, it kind of took a little bit of time to kind of come to terms with actually enjoying a couple of a, a couple of Western episodes for sure. And I even with the passers by the episode uh, set during the Civil War this season, um, that took that honestly took me talking about it on the podcast to kind of come to terms with it and kind of let it click with me. And I'll be completely honest up front. I do not think that this episode is going to click with me uh, through the act of talking to it. It's not an offensive episode. It's not a bad episode. It's not an episode that I it, it won't be like at the bottom rung of of ranking that I would eventually do probably maybe I don't know. But it won't it, it's not the worst episode by any stretch. It's just a very kind of kind of blah episode that I feel like wasn't it wasn't necessarily I don't want to say it wasn't written properly um but there are some kind of issues I have with the way that this show that this episode was written and the way that it was um kind of mapped out really I feel like it wasn't really that um that that tightly written um, I'll talk about it in specifics here in a bit, but I just feel like it, it is very much, I mean, it's a obviously 21, 22 minute episode, but by the like 18 minute, not 18 minute, but probably the 12 or 13th minute, it's like, okay, now is when the plot is actually moving. <laughs> uh, now is where the plot is actually getting into the Twilight zone stuff or, or actually dealing, like introducing the Twilight Zone element itself. And we have like a handful of minutes left and it just feels very, very, I don't know. It just, it just did not feel like it was, uh, it was mapped out, uh, properly. Pacing. That's the word I was looking for. (laughs) Um, I feel like this episode wasn't paced very well, um, in the writing. So, um, but I say that because even though these period stories in the Twilight Zone don't ever seem to really click with me all that well, I do like this idea. I don't know how... Um, I don't, I don't know how, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know how, uh, like, intentional this was or how conscious of this he was, but I do like the idea that Serling would, um, go back a hundred years in the past of the country, um, to a time where the country is being, has, was tragically divided, um, into two factions and very, very t- tumultuous time of war and everything, um, while he himself was living in an era of such division and such hate and uh, like on the precipice of the civil rights movement and everything um, and being very aware of those injustices that were occurring every day. So I kind of I, I do like the idea of him kind of pulling from history to kind of highlight even in even in the most subtle way that some uh, that that you kind of have to seek it out to kind of see any allegorical context for it. Um, but I do like that idea of him kind of doing that. And then, um, uh, I have in my notes, uh, then again, maybe this stupid ass country has always been divided and it's not a, a notable thing that he pulled from the past. So I don't know. Anyway, so, uh, so, uh, we open on Paradine and Doger, um, sitting uh, sitting at their little campsite and it's just the two of them. And Doger is going into, 
uh, so oh, nothing against the actor playing Doger, who is um, uh, Ben Cooper, but there is like a thing to his, not necessarily his performance, but the physicality of his performance. Like when he takes the cup of water or coffee or whatever, and he's he's shaking his hands, that feels like... I'd be very curious what take that was of that <laughs> because it felt like it was just very unnatural and very much like, okay, let's just get the shot done um, kind of thing. So that kind of took me out of it a little bit. But uh, the context or the content that Doger is saying is is more important because he is tired of the war. He's, he's tired of it. He's worried. He's scared. Um, and he is someone who something that I kind of found interesting was the way that he says that kind of at the beginning, um, they were, it was like they were playing, it was like they were playing as kids as in terms of presumably in terms of actually fighting the civil war. And I just kind of felt like, okay, that's, that's kind of, I don't know, that I, that doesn't really work for me. It, it doesn't really mix well with me. I, I don't, I don't know how else to say it, except that it just seems kind of, kind of strange, um, a strange pull, like, like that kind of tenuous, um, view of reality that he's hinting at, like, okay, well, we weren't really fighting or anything. It's just, it felt like we were playing at war, but now I've seen all this death and all of this pain and everything. And now it's weighing on me and everything. I don't know. It just feels like it, it feels like a character leap that we don't really have because that character is not really that solid of a character in it, <laughs> in and of himself. So it just seems like a weird kind of, um, thing to bring about in this in this episode for this character that doesn't really serve much purpose aside from something at the end that I'll talk to at the end of this review talk about at the end of this review so Paradine explains that kind of explains to us really <laughs> that they're on a scouting mission he says that while you're worried about all the death uh, all the death and everything before us um, I'm worried about these two scouts with this with a single piece of paper that are scouting this location to find Yankee soldiers and everything. He's basically he's saying that, you know, that's their job, that they are scouts and everything. It's very 1917, <laughs> uh, the movie 1917. Anyway, so they uh, are kind of interrupted and they hear Yankees on horseback in the town, which Yankees on horseback is my is the name of my debut album. Um, <laughs> just kidding. That's a stupid, weird joke. Um and then the sounds just completely disappear. And Paradigm decides that he's going to ride into town to get the intel. And it's this interesting kind of dichotomy between Paradigm and Doger in that Paradigm is, I wouldn't say that he's necessarily fearless, but he is very duty driven. He is very much like, okay, this is my job. I need to go scout this area and report back. And he's just very pragmatic in that respect. While Doger is sheepish. He's, he's, um, He's scared, and uh, I have uh, I have uh, in my notes that Paradine Paradine calls him out for being yellow, and uh, because he is being kind of cowardly and scared and everything, and so he says, like Paradine says, in this kind of almost I don't I hesitate to say heroic fashion because it's not really a heroic story or anything, but he says in this very kind of puffed up chest way saying that like, if I'm not back in 15 minutes, go ahead and go to camp and, uh, report that there's troops here. If you hear a shot, that's, you know what that is. So run and, uh, run back to camp and report it and everything. And if I'm not back in 15 minutes, go anyway. And, uh, whenever, he, when, he, whenever he said, uh, if I'm not back in 15 minutes in my head, I was just like, if I'm not back in 15 minutes, wait longer. Um, which I don't know what that's a reference to. Cause I just know in my childhood that, uh, my siblings always said it. Um, like if I'm not if I'm not back in ten minutes, just wait longer. Um, I don't know what that's a reference to, aside from my childhood. So Paradine arrives into town, and this is where the episode starts to kind of I don't want to say fall apart for me, but it's where the episode kind of takes takes an uphill climb to me. So Paradine is in town, and he hears a church bell ring, and his response is to hit the ground. Um, in the middle of an open road, just out in the open. And that just kind of seemed weird. I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's supposed to tell us that he equated the church bell with like a, some kind of uh, artillery fire or something, but it just seemed kind of weird and, and uh, kind of, I don't know, random. Um, <laughs> when I say that, I, like I do, I, I was trying to think, I was trying really hard to think of another word because <laughs> it just sounds like it just seems, seems so random. 
Um, but anyway, it just seemed it just seemed kind of strange for him to to just fall to the ground and and I don't know. Um, I don't know. It just seemed kind of weird. So he arrives into t- further into town and he finds literally a still valley. And again, this is where the episode kind of just does not work for me because every Yankee soldier he sees is frozen still, frozen in place. It's is it it's exactly like the episode Elegy. And that bothers me because this episode takes so much time out of its runtime to basically retread the same mysterious thing that happened in the season one episode, Elegy. And that just feels just I don't want to say lazy, but it feels very much like it just doesn't it doesn't work for me because I've already seen it and I've already seen it in a way that wor- it works a lot better in the in the episode Elegy because as Paradigm is walking through the town, he's kind of positing these little um, theories, I guess. Like at first he thinks they're asleep, even though they're standing still with their eyes wide open. And then he thinks that they're dead which again, they're standing still, um, in the, like it's that, that those are just weird conclusions to reach. And it's not like he's trying to figure it out. He's just like, Oh, they're dead. Or you guys are asleep and everything. He's being very loud and bombastic and everything. And even to the point where he starts celebrating saying that they're all his prisoners. Um, and it's not until he reaches, I think the, the wagon, that he starts to get kind of weirded out by it. But even then he looks through the wagon and everything. He's like, Oh, there's food and supplies here. That's stuff that we all, that we definitely need on our side. So thank you or whatever. And it just, I don't know. It just kind of that, that opening sequence where he first encounter not opening sequence, but that sequence where he encounters the still Valley just really, really just really did not, did not work for me because again, we've seen this in Elegy and we saw it to much better effect in Elegy, to be honest. And it just did not resonate with me in any meaningful way. And it kind of really took me out of it. And then to even further the comparison to Elegy, um, his kind of exploration of the town is interrupted by a plant falling from an open windowsill. And Paradine goes over to it. He picks up the, picks up the plant and, uh, says that it must have been the wind. It was nothing. And then he walks away. And then we get our act break where we see a hand move at the window. And like, again, that is exact, like that's, that's Elegy. Elegy ends, uh, Elegy's, um, first act break is them wandering through town and then going out of, uh, out of frame. And then you see Wickwire, who is thought to be still and, and frozen come to life and everything. And I mean, that's, it's retreading the same thing. <laughs> um, but fortunately, this is where the elegy comparisons end, because when we come back from the act break, um, he, Paradine tells, tells the old man to come out of the house and, um, you know, or else he's going to die. So Teague comes out and makes his grand entrance into the episode, and they both kind of talk to each other, and they agree that they both came close to dying. <laughs> And Teague uh, references uh, the book. And, or, so, so what happens is, um, oh God, what is? Oh, I I had his name in my head, a uh, paradigm. <laughs> um, he's like, oh, what were you going to kill me with that book there? And it's I I did like the the prop the prop design of the witchcraft book um, because it's very it's like it looks like a loose like manuscript. It doesn't look like an actual like book. Like if you think of. Um, like, like things like, uh, oh my God, the Sam Raimi movie, Evil Dead, like the book there, it's like, it's very just draw, drawing attention to it. And this is just like this flimsy, like manuscript. It might as well have been a script for the episode, um, kind of, uh, lackadaisically, uh, bound together with some big ass, um, kind of cover covering and everything. But, uh, Teague references the book and he says that he put a spell on the Yankee soldiers to put them to sleep. And we get a close up of the book. And while I do like the aesthetic of the, of the prop, just the title, like it just having the title say witchcraft is just, it kind of, it's a little bit indicative of how I feel about this episode overall, because it's very surface level. It's very much like, Oh, this is just, it's a book about witchcraft. So let's just name it witchcraft. And this episode is about temptation, uh, to, to collude with the devil. So let's just, and, and there's nothing really much of substance to that. <laughs> so why not just make the, make the book witchcraft? 
So, um, one of the, one of, if not one of the only, um, scenes that I actually really, really liked in this episode uh, is Teague's demonstration on Paradine. So he puts the spell on Paradine and freezes him in place. And that close up effect of Paradine freezing, um, as he's like, as he's like pointing a finger or whatever at Teague is really well done. And I thought that looked very, very cool and, and very, uh, eye catching. And then we get Teague's, um, kind of exposition dump. <laughs> and I kind of appreciate and respect this because he just basically just, it's like, it's like, uh, I don't know. It's like he he freezes uh, Paradine so that he can get all of this information out to him and everything. And it's I don't know. I just I I like I like it. Um, kind of as a like okay, shut shut up and listen to me. I'm going to freeze you and just listen to what I have to say. And uh, so so uh, Teague goes on to say, "I'm a witch man like my pappy before me, and I'm the son of a seventh son of a seventh son or whatever." And I got to say, Von Taylor does a really good job in this performance. He's really good. Um, he's, he's really good in that. Um, and I feel like there was a, there was a qualifier I was going to put on that, but I can't think, oh, but I feel like there isn't enough sense of urgency to it. And again, I think it's also just the fault of the pacing and the tone of the episode overall, because there's really nothing in this episode that has like much tension to it. Um, so Teague is talking about how he sees that, um, he's going to die tonight. And so he's going to leave the decision up to, uh, Paradigm, um, to decide whether or not to use the book on the entire union army and thus win the war for the Confederacy. And, I also found it interesting that as he's kind of talking about this, like right before he mentions that, it kind of gives that ultimatum or it gives that key to um, to Paradine. I kind of noticed that this is interesting because he talks about the Union soldiers coming into the southern towns and and kind of disrupting life with the war and everything. And again, this is interesting in that it's another story about Southerners being indignant about Yankees marching on the Confederacy. I just found that interesting. I don't know what conclusion I'm going to draw from that, but it's just interesting that the passersby and uh, Still Valley both have those same kind of attitudes um, from the pers- being from the perspective of um, people in the South and their indignant uh, thoughts about the Union soldiers. Basically, fighting a war on their land. So I don't know. I just, I just found that kind of an interesting kind of commonality between, uh, these two civil war episodes in season three. So Teague unfreezes paradigm. And he says that that's, that's when he says that he can freeze the whole union army. And again, this is like, I have in my notes. It's crazy that we're this deep into the episode. We're almost two thirds of the way through the episode itself. And it feels like right now we're just now getting started with it because this is the setup. This is the explanation of what's going on. This is what is starting to be kind of the big factor or big, um, big dilemma that's being thrust upon Paradine is about to be introduced here. And we're already two thirds of the way through the episode. This episode is almost over and it just feels just very, very disjointed and, kind of sloppy, to be honest. It's just, it's not paced very well for me at all. So that's when Teague says he's going to die when the sun goes down tonight. And so he's going to leave the choice about freezing the Union Army up to Paradigm. And so, so to kind of cover (laughs) the moral dilemma of this episode is should Paradigm use the book to win the war, but thereby condemning the Confederacy to work with the devil. And That's an interesting, that's an interesting scenario to kick out in this episode. I just wish that this was something that was introduced early in the episode and is something that didn't occupy, I feel like, I I wish that the explanation of it and the setup of it did not occupy literally the majority of the runtime in the episode. I really wish that it was a first act thing and then the second act would be Paradigm wrestling with that and trying to figure it out and everything. We get that in this, in this kind of last sequence here which I'll talk about, but I just wish that there was more to it. So we come back from the act break. Time has passed a very big time lapse, really, because Paradigm returns to camp that night. We're presumably we're, we, we presume that Teague has now died since the sun went down and, uh, Paradigm explains to the Lieutenant like, Oh, Hey, um, 
There are Union soldiers in the valley, uh, but they're all frozen because of witchcraft. And the lieutenant doesn't believe him um, and orders Paradine to get some sleep. And then Paradine doubles down on it. He's like, no, 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 this is real. I have this book. This Look at the title. It says witchcraft. Um, it's, it's legit. Um, so uh, it, and it falls on deaf ears. because It's basically like he's saying, like, oh, listen to my podcast. Um, so... Uh, Paradine then says that he used the book on a group of Union soldiers on his way back to camp, which is one of my big sticking points for this episode, because if you're going to spend the ma- literally the majority of the episode, if not an enti- the entire first act, with just slow, like retreading a past episode's kind of mystique, and then introducing us to this witchcraft element of it, and then give us this example of Paradine using it, using the power, using the book, using the witchcraft off screen, like doing that during an act break. That is another example of it just feeling very out of order and and disjointed because I don't, we didn't need the whole mysterious frozen union soldier stuff. We just needed him to, to meet Teague and learn about what it is and then make his decision. If he, if we had seen him go and, and, do that to the group of union soldiers, that would have been interesting. That would have kind of deepened it and shown that, okay, he does have this power. He is kind of, it could be him wrestling with the moral dilemma that he has as instead of just it being brought up off screen of something that happened while we were watching ads or while we were, um, uh, sitting there with the, um, I don't know the DVD skipping over to the next scene. So I don't know. So the Lieutenant, (sighs) okay. Anyway, um, I kind of lost track. I think, uh, okay. So, uh, the Confederate Confederate soldiers return, uh, because the Lieutenant said that, Oh, there's a, there's people there. Um, they'll, they'll get to the bottom of this. They'll figure it out. So the Confederate soldiers return and the character of Mallory comes up and he gives a report about finding a bunch of soldiers being frozen. It's the weirdest thing he's ever seen. He doesn't, he doesn't know what it is again, would have been really cool to actually see this, but, uh, whatever. So L- Lieutenant, the Lieutenant kind of realizes like, okay, well, I think Paradine is right. And that book is the devil's work. And Paradine goes into this impassioned speech talking about how the Confederacy is losing. Our cause is being, dismantled every single day and we need this book maybe we should use the devil's book in order to you know achieve what we want because other without it the confederacy is crumbling everything is turning to shit we're 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 doomed and then doger comes back and he um insists that paradigm use the use the book and this is one this is another thread that i actually found pretty interesting it took me a few viewings to really appreciate it but i like the idea that doger is kind of this symbol of for lack of a better word cowardice or he is he's the symbol of strain on the on the mental the mental state of the confederate army he is this embodiment of you know, conf- the, the soldiers being tired of war, being tired of, of fighting, a, fighting a losing battle, killing like brother, killing brother, all of the, all of the civil war tropes and, and ideas that, that are present are embodied in the character of Doger. And he's the one who insists and in, almost to the point of pleading to Paradigm to use the book, use it and make it good. Tell like, like use the book to put them all underground, put them all in the air, put them in, put them wherever you want. Just make it good, make it good so we can win this. And I found that to be really interesting in terms of the characterization of Doger because he is through and through kind of a coward <laughs> and he is kind of, he's, he's using this idea of this devil book, um, as, as a, as a reason to cut corners and to avoid fighting and just do the, basic, like real, like shortcut thing. And so Paladine starts reading from it and he stops. He, I really liked uh, the performance here um, because he's reading it and he's, he's like visibly struggling with it. He's struggling with it because he has a, he's forming a conscience and it's, it's, he's not sure if it's the right thing to do. So he eventually, he, he ends up stopping when he reads the words or he comes upon the words saying that uh, we renounce God. And he then, in that moment, after wrestling with Doger, 
Um, Paladine decides to let the cause die because if they use the book, like the way that he puts it is that, what do we call the Yankees? We call them the damn Yankees. And if we use this book, then we will be the ones who are damned. We will be damned to, you know, for eternity as being in league with the devil and everything. And, uh, and then that's where he decides to, you know, um, yeah, we're not going to use this. And he puts it in the fire. Uh, I think the Lieutenant is the one that's like, oh yeah, um, you know, uh, this book deserves to be in the fire. So put it in the fire. And then, yeah, um, that's, that's it really. And then we get the closing narration from Rod Sterling, which I will play right here. On the following morning, Sergeant Paradine and the rest of these men were moved up north to a little town in Pennsylvania, an obscure little place where a battle was brewing, a town called Gettysburg. And this one was fought without the help of the devil. Small historical note not to be found in any known books, but part of the records in the Twilight Zone. And that's our episode of Still Valley, honestly. Um, honestly, it's it's not a very good episode for me. It, it just did not have much to it in terms of the things that I love about the Twilight Zone. It didn't, it, I mean, it, while it did have this morality play behind it, um, the way that it rehashes the mystery of Elegy and the way that that rehashing of Elegy really takes up way too much screen time and how the rest of the story just doesn't build up enough steam from there, um, it just feels like a very hollow episode and especially coming off of, um, episodes like the midnight sun and death's head revisited, especially death's head revisited, um, coming back from coming off of those episodes into this episode that just feels very, uh, I I'm, I'm struggling to find the word, but I, I want to say it's kind of a, comes from a place of complacency. Like, okay, we're going to do a civil war story. This is about the temptation of the Confederacy to use uh, witchcraft in order to secure a win in the war. And it's about the human cost of war and all that. And like, that's fine. But it doesn't dive into it nearly as much as I feel like it should have or could have. So ultimately, I just felt like this was just kind of a um, bottom tier episode. It's not the worst episode, but it, it is definitely kind of down there. And what I found interesting was that while I was making my notes and everything and doing this kind of wrap up section, I kind of thought like this, this episode is, is very, it feels kind of lifeless and, and a little bit, um, a little bit hollow. And it, like, I was trying to think like, okay, well, it's not, it's not as bad as like, like Mr. Beavis or, um, to a lesser extent that like the mighty Casey or, um, or, um, Mr. Dingle, the strong, it's not as bad as those kind of, sort of silly episodes that don't really don't really work that well for me but it is it is kind of in the same level as say um the uh the whole truth from season two um because that episode I just feel like I felt the same way about about it that I feel about this one I just felt like it just didn't affect me and it was interesting because James Sheldon directed that episode as well (laughs) so now I'm kind of curious and kind of nervous about I sing the body electric because I am excited for that episode because of what I know about it which is very little but I also kind of feel like e- I don't know I I don't know how I how I'll feel about it, because um, I'm not sure how I feel about James Sheldon as a director for The Twilight Zone, even though I really liked It's a Good Life. So I don't know. Maybe I'm just uh, a little nervous. I don't know. So those are my thoughts on um, Still Valley. Uh, if you want to hear me actually talk to another person about this episode, check out Submitted for Your Approval. Link in the show notes and everything. The only piece of trivia I have for Still Valley um, is actually a piece of trivia that I think would have greatly improved the episode. So I'm going to read this from uh, from Unlocking the Door to a Television Classic by Martin Grahams Jr. So he writes... In the original draft of the script, after the book is tossed into the fire, Paradine learns from Dogert that they will be moving on to a little town called called Gettysburg. Gettysburg, Paradine remarks, will well, this one will have to fight without the devil. After that, Serling commented, and presumably this is going to be Serling's closing narration in that version of it, and I'm going to try to do another <laughs> Rod Serling impression like I did last week, so bear with me. Here we go. In a 
time to come during what will be Joseph Paradine's old and garrulous years. He'll tell anyone willing to listen that the Civil War wasn't lost at Antietam or Gettysburg or Shiloh. Rather, he'll insist the Confederacy was buried in the little valley hamlet called Chenau. People will probably laugh or pity him when he insists that the South lost a war because they refused a certain alliance. But we need, we need neither laugh nor pity because we know the nature of that alliance. Such alliances are the norm rather than the exception in the Twilight Zone. Um, so yeah, so that <laughs> that is what the original closing narration would have been. And I kind of feel like that would have made it made for a more interesting and compelling ending. Um, but I, I don't know. But then I, I don't know, because I also kind of feel like I'm coming, I'm coming at this from someone who is alive 150 or 160 years after the Civil War. And like, <laughs> we're in an age where, uh, you know, Confederate flags are a point of pride for some fucking morons in the country um, and not, you know, a point of uh, a symbol of racism or uh, treason, really. <laughs> um, but I kind of like, I kind of, what I inferred or what I projected onto that piece of trivia where Paradigm remarks, well, this is, this one will have to fight without the devil after discarding the, the book kind of feel like maybe that, like, I like the inference or how that kind of implies that, you know, the cause, the Confederate cause was, was rooted in like being driven by the devil, <laughs> like not, not overtly, not like they're not like all Satan worshippers shippers or anything, but I kind of like the idea that like, okay, they are fighting this battle, fighting for this cause that is wrong, is, is devilish and is whatever. Um, and then they discard the book and, you know, that's when, you know, the tide really, really shifts, uh, away from, from the Confederacy. But I don't know, again, that might just be 160 years later, me projecting on it, on it, uh, my current day feelings about the fucking Confederate flag that people seem to be very proud of. Anyway, so... <laughs> That's my review of Still Valley. Um, again, check out Submitted for Your Approval. I really like uh, the stuff that Brandon does. Um, he hasn't been, he hasn't done um, an episode of Submitted for Your Approval in a while, I don't think. But he does do um, Interdimensional RSS, uh, the Rick and Morty podcast, and Apathetic Enthusiasm. So check that out. And then also just another shout out to Victor Gamboa, who does the Outer Limits podcast. So anyway, check out all that. Listen to those podcasts instead of mine. <laughs> so. Oh, not really. Please listen to mine and also check out Patreon, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Okay. So that's my review of Still Valley. Now I'm going to complete this episode of the podcast with a brief non-spoiler review of, uh, science fiction theaters, barrier of silence. And I'm going to play some music here to bring us into this segment of the podcast. Silence is the 19th episode of season one of Science Fiction Theater, and it originally aired on September 3rd, 1955. The episode synopsis is a pilot loses his memory of what happened during a top secret flight, most likely due to intense sound. Scientists hope to retrieve his memory by subjecting him to intense silence. This episode was directed by Leon Benson, written by Lou Houston, and stars Adolf uh, Menju. Um, as Dr. Elliot Harcourt, Warren Stevens as Professor Richard Sheldon, Phyllis Cotis, Cotis as Karen Sheldon, and uh, Charles Maxwell as Robert Thornton. And uh, yeah, so the pre-show of this, so as um, as as I usually talk about, or as the as science fiction theater is usually done, <laughs> it opens with host Truman Bradley demonstrating some kind of scientific property or idea for the audience and then introducing the episode as um, playing with the themes of it. And so this episode, Barrier of Silence, is uh, showcases Truman Bradley um, showing us that he can't bend a steel bar, <laughs> um, uh, which is kind of, kind of silly and kind of funny. But uh, he then shows us a device that 
bends that actually bends steel and he ex- explains that it's an example of mechanical force and then he moves on to show us an, a lamp and how increasing the current can blow the bulb of the lamp and then he finally shows us uh how vibrating um how using a using a a, a tool to vibrate a point of glass um, or a piece of glass can cause it to break uh, once it reaches a, a breaking point. And then he leaves us with the theme of the story, which does the human mind have a breaking point? And so then we are brought into the episode. And I want to say again, and I'm going to be a broken record. This is the 19th episode of science fiction theater I reviewed, but man, it would be really cool if they remade this show or they revived this show specifically to make a science fiction anthology show that is based in science and actually demonstrates these scientific principles and everything. Um, I just wish I, I just, I don't know. I think that that could really be unique. So The episode opens with Dr. Richard Sheldon arriving in New York, and it's explained to us in voiceover that he does not have any memory. And furthermore, he is actually in a state of catatonia. He's catatonic. He does not not respond and everything. And it's kind of funny that (laughs) this episode is also somewhat weirdly paced, similar to the episode of uh, The Twilight Zone I just reviewed, because it's... So, so like, he is in... um, I guess like a lab or maybe maybe a hospital. I don't know. The sets all look the same in the show, but he's first in a uh, in an office and he's just in bed. He's catatonic and everything. And the the doctors try to inject him with truth serum, um, which I, I kind of laughed at because that's just kind of a silly like blanket kind of term like truth serum, and it works. It works because it it works to an extent because he can recite like who what his name is information about himself, but he still cannot account for the the missing time, and this is where it gets kind of kind of jumbly and weird because then he's taken to like the next scene is like oh uh, Doctor Sheldon was taken to um, Doctor Harcourt's office or home uh, for rest or whatever he was taken home and was be, going to be under observation so then we see him at home in bed. And same thing, he's catatonic and everything. And this is a very short scene because, uh, because it, it's just, it's kind of weird. Cause like there's, there's a noise. I think it's the fire engine or maybe that's the next scene. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's something that happens in the room. I can't remember what it was, but there's something that happens that increases the volume and, um, his wife is like, oh, okay, you can, you're responding to that. Like you're actually opening your eyes and everything. And it was kind of a weird and superfluous scene to, for the most part, because the next scene is, uh, is Truman Bradley in voiceover saying like, and then Dr. Sheldon was taken to a hospital and we just see the exterior of a hospital. And so he's, Sheldon is in bed in a hospital now. <laughs> And it's just like, we were just, he was just at home. We've seen this man laying in three different beds in the last like three minutes. Like, come on, this is like narrative whiplash. And so, uh, as he's laying in bed in the hospital, a fire truck outside, uh, is blaring its, blaring its siren as it passes by the hospital. And, uh, Sheldon actually wakes up and starts responding to it. And that I found to be, be pretty interesting because Dr. Harcourt deduces that sound is the key to unlocking his catatonia. And, uh, I, I gotta say at this point, like that's the, that's a big act break. Like we're going to find out what's happening to him because the sound is the key or whatever. But at this point I was wondering, this must've been a really easy role for Warren Stevens to play as Dr. Sheldon. Cause he's literally just been laying in bed and opening his eyes every like every once in a while so i kind of i kind of got like a little a little uh i don't know a little bit of humor out of that but uh but i will say later in the episode without going into context because i want to keep this spoiler free but later in the episode he does actually do a very good performance so i might talk around that a little bit but We'll get to that in a second. So, um, as part of an experiment, they decide to set up a very large device, like a big, like, um, oh God, what is it? Like a, I don't know, a thing, <laughs> frequency thing, um, to emit sound directly at him, um, at increased frequencies at him. And this, I'm going to, I'm going to be kind of, kind of, uh, a little nerdy and off topic here, but, 
I thought it was, I thought this was kind of funny because, and it, kind of funny and kind of interesting. So let me break this down for you. So we've got Dr. Sheldon's wife and we've got the doctor and like another doctor, the two doctors that are working on it um, in the room with Dr. Sheldon, who is still catatonic and in bed. So they have this big ass, like, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but this big, like kind of megaphone looking thing pointed at Dr. Sheldon. Like this thing is massive. It's like the, like four, four of his heads size. Uh, sized and um it's uh it's like it's like it's like the satellite dish kind of thing that kind of look where it's like pointing it's emitting frequencies at him so i thought it was funny because this is a massive massive thing in the in the context of the of the set and then i think it's dr harcourt is like and we're going to be wearing these head these headsets uh so that we can talk to each other as we're emitting this because uh, the, the frequencies, the decibels that are going to be emitting from this are going to be really, really high and we need to shield ourselves from it. And like the headphones that they have are these very, very small, granted it's 1955, but like these very small, like, um, little tiny padded headphones that go over the ears, but don't cover the whole ear. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like Sony Walkman, like back in the nineties, like those types of ones. And it's just funny. Cause like now we have like over the ear, like noise canceling headphones and stuff. And I just thought it was funny that, okay, they're going to blast this sound at this catatonic man. And in order to listen to each other through a, through a speaker or through a, through a microphone in the room, <laughs> they're going to have these little tiny headphones. So I thought that was kind of funny. And then the other kind of interesting part of, part of it is that when they are, Emitting the frequency at Dr. Sheldon, um, the monitor shows like the shows like wavelengths of it and everything. And I just thought it was interesting because it's like the same the same visual that would go on to kind of be not same exact, but the same style that would be be go on to be used in the outer limits opening, like that kind of single line wavelength that uh, moves as the control voice talks. It's like that same visual in in this episode of science fiction theater. And then the ultimate piece of nerdy um, digression in this review is that in order to talk to one another, they speak into a microphone. And that microphone, I thought that this was mildly interesting because in in the pursuit of me upgrading all of my podcast equipment a few months ago, I did a lot of research on different microphones, different different boards, different uh, pieces of equipment, different boom mics, different or di- boom arms and different um, different connectors, all these different things. And I just got kind of obsessive about it. So I just want to shout out that <laughs> I believe that the microphone they use to communicate to each other in this episode while they're running the test, I believe that it is a sure brand Unidyne 1955 microphone. Um, and that, if I'm not mistaken, was popularized by, by Elvis. Um, it was kind of, it's like that steel or that chrome looking, um, kind of broadcast microphone design, um, that you would see like Elvis, like cradling it as he's singing into it and everything. Um, and if I'm, if I'm right about that, cause I don't know if this is like, maybe this is an older design or whatever, but this episode aired in September of 1955 and the sure Unidyne that I believe that this microphone is, was released in 1955. So I thought that that was interesting that it, could have potentially been brand new at the time and kind of neat if I'm right. And I kind of wondered if it was a point of product placement. I, <laughs> I actually went through the credits to see if I could see like the sure brothers or sure in- incorporated or whatever the name was in 1955, um, as being any kind of, uh, um, providing any materials or anything, but I couldn't find anything in the credits, but, uh, that microphone is, I believe, um, the sure Unidyne, uh, 1955 or 5511, I don't know, um, microphone, which they now currently like sure has been around for obviously like a hundred years and they have, uh, I think that they have like the new, like new, um, kind of sure Unidyne classic microphones, which have that same design. Um, so, so yeah, I think that that's the case. I have pod mic microphones for podcasting from Rode. So we're a Rode podcast here. And, uh, but I do have sure SM 58s, which are just these legendary di- dynamic hand- handheld microphones that are just wildly, wildly popular. But I have those for, 
uh, mobile recording and my mobile recording setup and everything. So, um, yeah. So anyway, that's a peek behind the curtain for the podcasting side of things. Um, if you want to learn more about podcasting microphones and stuff, I actually do recommend checking out, uh, YouTube guy, um, (laughs) Tom Buck, uh, dude has tons and tons of content about microphone reviews and stuff. He's very thorough, very cool. Um, and also follow him on Twitter at so darn Tom. Anyway, um, so, th- so that's all just craziness there. So I thought that was pretty cool. And so the rest of the episode, I won't go into much detail about it, but I do want to highlight that the scene where Warren Stevens really kind of shines in, in his moment is where th- I won't go into context of what it is, but he is being kind of dehypnotized essentially. And he is speaking in, with these very labored breaths and very labored speech patterns as like sweat is pouring off his face. And I think that he did a really fantastic job. And also the makeup effects and everything and the sweat was just really cool. It like it it was very it was almost painful to watch. And the set that they designed for this really, really shocked me with how cool it was. So they create this room that has this this apparatus in the middle of it that's kind of like a kind of like a, um, I want to say like a kind of trapeze platform that rises and lowers in the middle of the room. And it's in the shape of a cone. And it's referred to as a cone of silence where no sound can escape this, this cone of, of area in, in the room. And it's just really cool. The, the effects that they use to try to demonstrate the power of the cone of silence is really interesting. And just the overall design of the room is very cool, especially for a show that as I've kind of, made references to um throughout past reviews it it recycles the same set all the time and to see this new different set that's very detailed and has a lot of 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 uh set decoration to it was a was a very nice uh very nice and welcome change for it so i don't know so at the end of the day this episode of science fiction theater is uh is is solid i mean it's fine it's uh it's fine. Yeah, it's science fiction theater. I do like, or I was very taken with it, that it didn't set up necessarily this unknowable situation. Instead, it sets up this mystery about this person, and it goes through the scientific lengths of figuring out what's wrong and diagnosing what's wrong and figuring out how to fix it. Instead of it being this unexplainable thing, it's not like, oh, shocking, like this man cannot speak or whatever. It's like, no, he may have experienced some kind of trauma or some kind of hypnosis or something and may need medical attention. And let's figure out how we're going to administer that medical attention. So I do like how it kind of took that grounded approach to it without ever really heightening itself while also having a subject or a a plot summary or plot plot dynamic that would have been at home with that. (laughs) Like it would have been, it would have been something that, um, it would have been, it would have befitted that kind of supernatural type of storytelling, um, or implication, but it didn't go that route. And I respect it for that. And, uh, and yeah, so that's my review. That's my episode. Um, hope you guys liked my reviews of still Valley and barrier of silence. Um, next time on the podcast, well here in a couple of days, I'm going to get my next episode in my solos bonus episode series up. And again, If you pledge $10 per month on Patreon, you can get access to all of those episodes right up front, as well as 133 B-roll episodes of just me and my friends just bullshitting and everything. I am doing a much more in-depth than I thought I would um, uh, uh, episode-by-episode progress report on my journey through the Mass Effect Legendary Edition video game. Uh, It's a remaster of my favorite video game franchise, uh, science fiction, RPG storytelling, very fun space opera. It's very cool. Um, I'm doing episode-by-episode kind of... Not episode-by-episode, but I'm doing episode check-in. So the one that is accompanying this episode of Anthology is a 45-minute just rant about, not rant, but celebration of Mass Effect 1 after I've beaten it. So check it out. Uh, Patreon.com slash Obsessive Viewer. You get access to those B-roll episodes at $1 per month. And again, $2 per month gets you uh, TV reviews and everything. So uh, yeah, so next week... um, next, probably Saturday or Sunday, I'm going to have episode 76 of Anthology, in which I will be reviewing The Jungle, uh, season 3, episode 12 of The Twilight Zone. And the bonus episode I'm going to, or the bonus review I'm going to accompany with that is Science Fiction Theater, season 1, episode 20, The Negative Man. 
And uh, that'll do it for this episode of Anthology. I just want to say thank you guys so much for listening, and uh, and any support you give me is just really appreciative. And uh, yeah, so thank you guys so much for listening, and have a good one. And now, here's a short clip from our Patreon-exclusive RSS feed. To hear the full clip and more exclusive Patreon content, go to patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer and become a patron at the minimum rate of $1 per month. Thank you and enjoy. I think that it's just, it, it's an inevitability with, uh, with the character, but Rex just shoots him. He kills him just dead, point blank, um, just as you're talking to him and everything. And he's like, he wasn't going to talk or whatever. And so it's this very cool, like anti-hero kind of moment for Rex that kind of just made me kind of fall in love with the character. Cause it's just, I mean, it's kind of cliched it's, but it's just such a badass kind of maneuver and everything. And I remember that from the game informer review, because I remember them equating it to it being like a Han Solo moment for Rex. And even though I'm not a big fan of star Wars, I still appreciate that as this kind of roguish kind of, uh, kind of character trait for uh, for Rex, and so Rex has a has a very uh, very nice soft spot in my heart um, because he's such a cool character. The problem that I have with the franchise overall, though, anthology is edited and produced by Matt Hurt and presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. For a full archive of our episodes, go to anthologypod.com/archive. You can also like the Facebook page at facebook.com slash anthologypod and follow the show on Twitter at OVAnthologyPod. If you enjoy the show, please take a couple minutes to leave us a rating and a quick review on Apple Podcasts. This is the easiest way to support what we do, and all it costs is a little bit of your time. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can make a PayPal donation at anthologypod.com slash donate or support us on Patreon for recurring donations and access to commentary tracks and B-roll audio recorded exclusively for patrons at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Every donation goes toward paying the fees to keep the podcast running and is greatly appreciated. Official Anthology merch, including shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more can be found in the Obsessive Viewer's Tee Public store. You can find a link to the store in the show notes of this episode and at anthologypod.com slash donate. Or you can simply search for Obsessive Viewer at teepublic.com. For information about the Obsessive Viewer's annual live event showcasing short horror films from local filmmakers, check out shocktoberinirvington.com. And for an archive of all our events, as well as news about potential future events, head over to obsessiveviewer.com slash live. For more podcast content, you can find our flagship movie and TV review and discussion show, The Obsessive Viewer Podcast, at obsessiveviewer.com, and on Twitter, at Obsessive Viewer. You can also find Tower Junkies, a podcast where Matt and co-host Tiny share their love of all things Stephen King and his magnum opus, The Dark Tower series, over at TowerJunkiesPod.com and at TowerJunkiesPod on Twitter. And finally, check out The Secular Perspective, Tiny's side project podcast, which tackles current events and life's big questions from the perspective of secular hosts Chad and Amanda at TheSecularPerspective.com. Bumper music for this podcast comes courtesy of As Good As It Gets, which can be found at facebook.com slash as good as it gets band. You can also find As Good As It Gets music on Spotify, Google Play, and iTunes. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Kitty! Yeah!